Long identified with its churning steel mills and bustling manufacturing sector, the city of Hamilton has seen a lot of change in the past few decades. And for the more than half a million residents, it's a mix of good and bad, with the gap between those two growing in ways that make it tough for many. Here to explain how it's affecting people's health and well-being, we welcome Sarah Mayo, social planner with the Social Planning and Research Council of Hamilton. Laura Katari, campaign coordinator for the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction. And Steve Bust, investigative reporter at the Hamilton Spectator, and we are happy to welcome you back here. You've been here before. And Indeed. You, both of you here for the first time. I want to, Steve, we're going to pick up on your really quite excellent series for the spec and uh, share some of these uh, facts with our viewers, and then we'll do a little Q&A after that. So, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this graphic up. Here are the results 10 years after Steve began his Code Red project looking at the quality of life in Hamilton. And one of the things he found was that of 13 indicators, 10 decreased, meaning the quality of life in those 10 areas got worse. Only two increased significantly. Emergency room visits went up 30% over the decade, while the population of Hamilton only increased by 6%. And emergency room visits for psychiatric reasons went up by 60%. Okay, Steve, these are a few of the categories that we looked at. You looked at many other indicators, such as what? I think the one that probably shocked people the most was the gap in lifespan between the best and the worst neighborhoods in Hamilton. So we found uh, 10 years on from the original project, uh, a 23 year difference in lifespan uh, between the best and the worst neighbors. We had, we have a neighborhood in Hamilton where the average lifespan uh, in 2016, 2017 was 64.8 years. I mean, that doesn't even get you to your pension. And, uh, you know, to, to have that kind of outcome worse than Eritrea and Sudan, uh, you know, these are third world outcomes in a city and a country as rich as Cam Hamilton or as Canada. And that's just, frankly, both horrifying and, and shocking. Do you I want think. to say what neighborhood it was? Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a neighborhood right near the, the downtown. So it's, it's in a really challenged part of the city. Um, but I think what's really important is these huge disparities that we're seeing across the city. And these disparities time and time and time again are the same. Uh, the wealthy parts of the city have good outcomes and the poor parts of the city have really, really bad outcomes. And let's, that's what's discouraging. Let's ask the obvious follow-up question, which is what contributes to all of that? I think that, um, I think there's two things. One, uh, Hamilton still has uh, high rates of poverty, but more importantly has really concentrated areas of poverty. And just, we're seeing income inequality uh, is actually growing across the city. So just, just the fact that we have these huge disparities in wealth is what really leads to poor health. Laura, can you help us understand that? Because I've looked at the numbers here, and there are some neighborhoods where the poverty rate, the, the percentage of people in poverty, is 4.5%. And there are other neighborhoods where it's literally almost half the people. How does that happen? There are a few factors. Uh, one, there are neighborhoods, uh, because they're economically depressed, that attract more people simply because of rental rates and what people can afford. So people tend to congregate in areas that they'll be able to afford to live in. But I think the increase is directly related to income precarity, um, people finding it more and more difficult to live. Um, we've seen rental rates rise and people's incomes are not following suit. So people are um, moving or trying to move, not always successfully, <laughs> um, and trying to find a way to make something work that's really impossible. Sarah, from your experience, can you share some insight as to why the poverty seems to be so concentrated? Well, you know, I mean, Hamilton, we, we're experiencing what many cities across Canada are experiencing. It's not Hamilton specific. Mm -hmm. Toronto has higher poverty rates than Hamilton, higher rates of inequality than Hamilton. What's different maybe in Hamilton is that, in, you know, cities like Toronto have sort of exported a lot of their poverty outside of the downtown into the older suburban areas, and it's less visible on an everyday basis to people who, who pay attention and, and should be paying more attention to these things. And so in Hamilton, there's um, 
uh, when we, we do a map of poverty in Hamilton, yes, it's it's more concentrated in the lower city, but that doesn't mean, you know, the suburbs have, have found a way to, to solve poverty that the lower city hasn't. What we're mapping is, is uh, where are affordable rents, where is affordable housing in Hamilton, and uh, mo most of the social housing has been built in the lower city. Um, and so it's a good thing in a way in that we are, there is um, higher rates of social housing in Hamilton than in other cities, so that protects people from these high rates of, of rental. But it's not, um, we, we need those kind of affordable housing options in all parts of the city, in, in all cities across, Hamil uh, across Canada. I'm going to pick up on that more in a second. But I want to pick up first, Steve, with you on that word visible that Sarah just used. How visible is poverty in Hamilton? You know, I, I think that people who live in Hamilton, and when we talk about Hamilton, it's important to, to note that we're talking about the old city of Hamilton. We're talking about the Mike Harris Hamilton. So the old former city of Hamilton and the five suburban areas, Stony Creek, Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, Glanbrook, that have been sort of glommed on to Hamilton thanks to amalgamation. So the super city, as it was called. Yeah, and, and so... Half a million people. So what we see here is this, is this rich suburban ring around the outside, uh, as I say to people, you know, Hamilton's a lot like a donut. It's got this, uh, it's got this healthy ring around the outside, and then unfortunately, it's got this kind of rotten hole right in the middle. And so, um, you know, people who live in Hamilton, it really depends on where you live in Hamilton. Which part are we talking about? Are we talking about the rich suburbs? Are we talking about the mountain? Are we talking about the lower inner city, where a lot of the, these challenges are are situated? Uh, anecdotally, I've never seen it the way it is the last couple of years in terms of, you know, people being on the street. The visibility is there. It's just, it, I mean, we have some people living in tents across from the Hamilton Spectator building in some bushes. I mean, we can see when the leaves drop in the fall, we see these encampments. I mean, I've never seen that before. It's 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 really disturbing right now. Let me ask you about the hole in the donut, not the not the better off suburbs, but the hole in the donut down, downtown and so on, the inner city. What are the consequences of having so much poverty so concentrated in one area? So we know uh, mixed income communities are best. They're best not only for the people living in poverty, but they actually create more vibrant communities when you can mix incomes, mix backgrounds. Um, they become attractive. The problem when you have concentrated poverty, and I mean, it'd be too simplistic to just say, you know, policing rates or uh, things like that. It gets really difficult. I think the biggest problem is getting anyone in those neighborhoods to actually do something. Um, when you look at more affluent areas, you have brand new recreation centers, you have a lot of facilities, a lot of investment in those areas. When you have concentrated poverty, you don't have that as much. So what ends up happening is not only do they live in poverty, but all the resources that we tend to think of as being available to us are not there. And if you're raising children or you're a young adult and you're living in these areas, it's very hard to dream and look forward if there's nothing around you that is aspirational. And it becomes difficult. You want to follow up on that? The difficulty of all that concentration of poverty? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to... We, we'll, in these discussions, we really have to make sure to avoid stigmatization mm -hmm. in terms of, we, we don't want people to feel like, oh, I don't want to live there because there's a high concentration of poverty. In some ways, there are, um, uh, you know, there are more services uh, uh, that that can help people in an easier way when, when there's concentration of poverty uh, uh, in, in some neighborhoods than if people, if they live in, for instance, in Toronto, where there's a lot of poverty in the outlining areas where there's no transit and it's very difficult to get to, uh, em, you know, employment training services or, or other things that, that people may need. So, so it's not always, um, but it's not always, we can't look at it in a simple way, mm. um, but I think that that we need to, um, you know, think about the ways that that we can um, create more affordable housing opportunities so that 
so that everyone has a choice of where to live um, and they're not relegated to just one area because of their income. Well, can I do one example for you? And full disclosure here, I'm a Hamiltonian originally. My, you know, folks still live there, lots of family there. Uh, I know of an example in the North End, a uh, so-called Keith neighborhood, which has been one of the priority neighborhoods that, that uh, have, I'm sure the spectator has covered often. And it was a situation where there were no bus stops there and there were no grocery stores there and there were no services there. There was nothing there. Uh, many in the community have come together. There's a place there called the Eva Rothwell Resource Center. There have mm -hmm. been efforts put into having a dentist come by once a week. You know, you can pick up clothes as you need them. Uh, Health care is available there, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make a difference? For sure. On a, you know, I mean, those are the things that can be done uh, you know, the, these problems are structural, as we say. You know, they're, they're, they're um, about income inequality issues that a city can't solve. But a city can do some of these um, uh, sort of daily living, make daily living easier. Um, and so, yeah, if you offer services, bring services to where people live, um, that's absolutely, uh, uh, and the Eva Rothwell Center is a great example of, of, of doing that, of, of saying, okay, we can't solve everything, but what can we do here and now for people in this neighborhood um, that haven't had attention? Let's, let's pay more attention and, and, and give them more services. Do you know about this place? So it's, it's interesting that you picked the Keith neighborhood because in the original Code Red project, um, which just so that people understand, Code Red was about uh, looking at health data for people who lived in Hamilton and then grouping it together into small neighborhoods, 140 of these neighborhoods in Hamilton, and then looking at the social and economic factors and mapping them out. And basically you saw these huge correlations between uh, poverty, low income, low education, and poor health outcomes. And the Keith neighborhood in the original Code Red project from 10 years ago uh, was the, the worst performing neighborhood. Um, it's in the in, North End, near the yeah, steel right mills. Yeah, near the steel mills, yep. um, not pretty. Um, and so in this particular 10 year sequel, the Keith neighborhood actually had some very significant improvements in a number of health areas. And so I went and talked to the head of the neighborhood association and you know, he said, 10 years ago, I cursed your name. I, I remember calling you up and saying, okay, great, you ripped the Band-Aid off, now what? How are you gonna help us fix this? And 10 years on, uh, they made some significant improvements in, in some key areas of, of health. Mm -hmm. I went back and asked him, and I said, so what caused this? And he said, we were angry. We were angry and uh, we felt stigmatized and we decided we wanted to do something about it. And so, you know, it's a great example of if you can mobilize people's interests and their concerns and you can find some way to, to you know, row your boat uh, in the same direction that you can make some changes. Can you replicate that experience in other priority neighborhoods in the city? I think you can, I think you can. Um, it's not easy though, because I mean, you're talking about changing a lot of things, you know, fixing people's health is fixing income, education, your parents, your neighborhood, your physical environment. I mean, these are what's called the social determinants of health and, and that's not easy. And 10 years, we, look, we understand 10 years is not long enough to fix population health. That requires a generation or more. Um, but it can be done, it can be done. Laura, I wanna ask you about the opioid crisis. How is it manifesting itself in Hamilton and contributing to what we're talking about here? I think you end up with so many layers of issues to deal with in a community and they overlap. You know, we're looking at mental health issues that are not addressed, um, homelessness and opioid usage and trying to piece it, <laughs> not piece it together, it's easy to piece together, but to take it apart, to find effective ways to get into the community, to gain trust among individuals um, and have them utilize those services. Um, I think Hamilton's doing well with that. We have great outreach resources in that sense. But for me, when I look at it, it's like, why is this rising? Um, we come up with really great band-aids in the community, but actually looking at um, supply, 
why youth or younger people are turning to this and try to stop it upstream before it begins. Mm. Can I ask you, Sarah, about the basic income program and just to remind everybody, uh, the previous Liberal government in Ontario set up a basic income pilot program in three different municipalities around Ontario. Hamilton slash Brantford was one of them. Uh, I guess they were a, f a, f a couple of years into this pilot program. The Conservatives then won the 2018 election. They cancelled the program almost immediately, which is to say it's only been a year and a half since the thing's been cancelled, and I don't know that you have any hard data on the impact that the cancellation has had. But if you do, can you share it? And if you don't, can you give me your anecdotal sense of where things are at? Well, we, we know, you know, anecdotally, I mean, there's, there's people who, have, who were on basic income who have died who, since then and who have, who have really, it was a, a mental uh, impact, anguish and, and, and physical impact on them because it was such a betrayal. Because if, if, if people had known that, okay, it's a political football and, and some parties are against it and some parties are, against, are, are for it, there would at least be a, but, it, but the way it happened in the election, um, it was all the parties said they were in favor of it, and then uh, after the election, this government got elected and 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 changed its mind with with no notice. And I, so I want to be clear here. You're saying you I assume you're talking about Michael Hampson. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. He was the individual yeah. in question who's yeah. no longer with us. Yes. And are you saying his death is attributable to the cancellation of basic income? I am not a medical doctor. Okay. Well, we got to be careful <laughs> I mean, here about allegations we throw around, right? So. No, but there's there's clear impact that that it, 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 there there have been um, we we know how much basic income reduced stress on people, and we know that the cancellation so so a going back to an, a very stressful social assistance uh, income system and on top of it the stress of the, the the way the cancellation was done is enormous and cannot be quantified. Um, but but we know that um, we can't attribute things, but we can we know that it contributed for Let's, sure. Uh, well, we shouldn't assume everybody knows who Michael was, but you, yes. can you share his story with us? So Michael Hampson was an activist in Hamilton. Um, at one point back in the day, I think in the 90s, he was actually active with Greenpeace. Um, he was part of the group um, that supported uh, Indigenous. Um, persons in Hamilton um, during the Red Hill Expressway protests. Mm -hmm. And when, unfortunately, he became um, wheelchair bound after spinal surgery, um, he had to have a tumor removed. And unfortunately, it wasn't as successful as he had hoped. Um, and disability activism was huge. He. Uh, he started something called a crawl in. He's done it um, in the legislature here in Ontario. He's done it at city council, um, trying to bring awareness to how unfair and how un unaccessible life is when you're wheelchair bound. Mm -hmm. So, looking at that, um, I knew Michael quite well through his activism and before in our younger years in Hess Village and across the city. Um, How did he die? So he had been ill with blood infections on and off for three years. Uh, one of his points in his activism uh, was about getting regular home care to ensure that the sores would get adequately treated all the time, um, his frustration with people not showing up and not assisting him. When he was on basic income, um, not only did he feel he was leading a more dignified life, everything from haircuts to clean clothing, to be able to afford laundry, to be able to pay for assistance when his regular assistants wouldn't show up. Um, and while you can't directly attribute blood poisoning to basic income cancellation, his own family members and those of us around him um, I think the best term you could use, he was broken hmm. after the cancellation. His mental health um, never recovered. And he died last month. And he died in the last month, yes. Steve, what have you seen and or heard about the cancellation of the basic income pilot program and what that has contributed to what we've been talking about? I think probably the, the, the most disturbing part of it is that it was cancelled in, in the minds of people in Hamilton 
it was canceled with no clear evidence. So it was just an arbitrary decision. It would be one thing if you had a program and you analyzed it and you let it run its course and you decided that it just wasn't working and then you made the decision to, to pull the plug on, on that program. I think what really angers people in Hamilton is that the decision was made with no evidence at all. And in fact, there are people in Hamilton who were studying the, the impact of this and, and gathering evidence. People like Jim Dunn, uh, a well-known um, you know, social professor at uh, McMaster University, he was part of the team of people gathering data, analyzing the evidence. And the evidence seemed to be pointing to exactly what we're talking about, that this was changing and helping people's lives. And then they had the rug pulled out from under them. And I think that's what's caused a lot of the of the angst in Hamilton is that these people in good faith were part of a program, had the rug pulled out for them from under them, and now are back in worse situations than they were before they started. Well, Sarah, I should ask you, because we do see on the covers of magazines that Hamilton is considered kind of one of the cool places to live in the province of Ontario now, right? It's been referred to as the Brooklyn of the North, and there are neighborhoods that are gentrifying, and there are, you know, places where there are cute little cafes and coffee shops being set up. And that is an, that is a, you know, you can afford to buy a home there. That's an increasing impression of Hamilton. How accurate is it? I think that there's been, uh, you know, cities are always in transformation. Cities are never, you know, exactly the same 10 years ago. In, in the next 10 years, Hamilton will be different, just like any, any other city in Hamilton, in, in Canada. Um, and I think that, yes, there has been, uh, uh, you know, there's growing inequality, like there is in ca across Canada. There's growing inequality in Hamilton. And so there are more uh, retail shops that cater to a, a higher-end clientele, um, but there's continuing um, poverty and, and, and growing gap between between the two, um, and and so uh, and and but but the it can help the whole city in that there's more investment um, and so there's more jobs than there were so so that's certainly a good thing. I, I am hearing lots of stories constantly about people who are fed up with Toronto. They can't afford housing prices here. They go to Hamilton and they're you know happy as hell. You hear that too, I presume. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, gentrification is happening in Hamilton. There's there's no doubt about it. And it's happening, and I think what's causing the friction in Hamilton is that the gentrification is, is happening geographically in places that have been traditionally affordable places for people to live. And so, uh, you know, you Hamiltonian know that the lower city has these beautiful old Victorian homes. Um, however, you know, some of these Victorian homes may be two-family homes or three-family homes, and then all of a sudden they're converted back into being a beautiful one-family home. And so you have this displacement of people. And so it's the, that age-old tug of, um, you know, yes, we should be welcoming the fact that there are uh, wealthier people bringing investment, bringing their money to Hamilton. Um, you know, rising real estate values, you know, is, is a double-edged sword. Yep. Um, it's great for those who already have real estate. It's not great for people who want to get real estate. Yep. Um, but the, it's that age-old tug between, so you've got these people coming into your city, bringing wealth with them are they versus the displacement people? of, exactly. and where do those people go? And if those are, if those are disadvantaged people mm -hmm. and rents are rising and real estate prices are rising, then are you just booting them down the highway to yep. the to the next place that they can afford. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've been here many times, but I'm not sure I've ever asked you what neighborhood you live in in Hamilton. Where do you live? I currently live in Corktown, so I am downtown. Okay, um, that's a nice part of town. It is now. It's gentrifying yeah. quite well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you the, say that as a positive thing? So, I, I think we've talked about this before, but I'm gonna say it again just in case. The problem with gentrification goes far beyond the cost of housing, even though housing costs are so important to be able to remain housed. Gentrification is about an entire community changing, including the shops that are there, access to groceries, to laundry mats, everything around it. So even if people don't have their rent increasing, you start to lose the amenities that they're used to that they can afford, mm -hmm. including coffee shops. Instead of a $2 coffee, you're now paying a $5 coffee. Um, you know, boutique grocery shops instead of 
something more affordable. Mm -hmm. And so their cost of living starts to go up or they're paying more for transportation to go outside their area to somewhere affordable. So in my neighborhood, it would be fantastic if it wasn't for the fact it is starting to displace people and rents are starting to go up. Well, let me ask you about that because uh, it, it is not apparent from our conversation mm -hmm. here, but you are a person who fights with disabilities. Indeed. And you are on a disability pension as a result. Yes. And I, I wonder whether or not the, the gentrification of the neighborhood in which you live, which from an outsider's point of view may look like a wonderful re regeneration of the city, whether it's causing problems for you in your everyday life now. Absolutely it is. How so? So I, I count myself lucky because I'm employed part-time um, and I do have a condominium unit, unfortunately, due to my mom's passing. The past year, in order to keep up with property values in our neighborhood, we've looked at um, whether to do a special assessment or take a loan for our condominium corporation. So in one fell swoop, we went for the loan instead of special assessment because many like me are either fixed income seniors or people with disabilities in the building. My maintenance fees alone went up $140. For the condo? For the condo. Every month? Every month. And your- In one year. Disability like, support just, payments are not going up that much every month. It's frozen. Yeah. Uh, even with my CPP disability, which does increase, it's indexed, ODSP takes a dollar for dollar off of their check. So unless I get a really significant increase in hours, which I can't do because of my disability, I'm stuck. And even more so, the stress mounts because if I lose my employment to either inability to work or it's not there anymore, I won't be able to maintain my housing. And when I look at real estate values across the city, I really don't have many options as to, you know, selling and being able to purchase somewhere else. Well, you, 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 probably, couldn't see, you probably couldn't sell your condo and purchase another place in Corktown. You'd have to move to a, what do I call it? A lower income neighborhood, a lesser neighborhood? Uh, you don't want to do that, obviously. But in Hamilton, there aren't. I mean, very, very few, and I don't want to name neighborhoods mm -hmm. specifically. Um, there are very few places where a condo would be cheaper than what I would sell for. Hmm. So then, because of rules, I wouldn't get income. I would have to spend any equity that I'd made from it before I could have ODSP income. I get you. It's horrible. <laughs> Steve, tell us this, and I know, you know, for people watching who don't live in Hamilton, or even maybe for those who are in Hamilton, we know it sounds like we're picking on the, the steel city here, or the ambitious city, as we called it when I was a kid living there. But I do want to ask this. Is there something particular about the city of Hamilton that makes these problems that we've been describing here particularly challenging? So I, I think Hamilton is still figuring out how to deal with its history its legacy of being a, a steel maker, a heavy industry manufacturing city where um, for many, many decades, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, you know, eras when you could literally be an immigrant who got off the boat on a Sunday and on Monday get a job at a steel maker. That's, mm -hmm. that's not an exaggeration. That is the way it used to be in the 50s and the 60s. At a pretty good wage. At a good, and so, uh, so that was great. You could, you know, th through, through the strength of unionization and, you know, good working conditions, good wages, you could live a great life, make a decent wage with no education or little education. And then in the span of a generation, uh, so I, in the original Code Red, I, I said that in a five kilometer by two kilometer stretch on the waterfront along Burlington Street, in the span of one generation, 25,000 jobs were lost just from that little strip. That's what the steel companies are. That's with the loss of jobs. So the irony, of course, is that Stelco and DeFasco are producing as much steel as they did 40 years ago with less than a tenth of the workforce. Mm -hmm. And so you lost these 25,000 jobs, good paying jobs, that could support 100,000 people, and they're gone in, in, in you know, almost the blink of an eye. And, 
And so we're still struggling with, you know, so where are these good paying jobs with, uh, where you didn't need a high level of, of skilled trades or, or even education, and those are gone now. And so we're still trying to figure out how to make that transition to this, this new world, and a lot of people got left behind. Sarah, we've got about a minute to go here. If you wanted to give the province of Ontario some advice on how they might improve the situation, what would you say? I think that there's a lot that can be done to give power back to people. Um, you know, we, that, that, that might not even cost anything. You know, it doesn't have to be uh, uh, solutions that, that increase the deficit if that's a concern. It can be things like giving workers more rights in the workplace, uh, putting more regulation around temp workers and, and around uh, workers' health and safety, reducing uh, employment discrimination for people, which is a huge issue. So giving more power to workers, um, improving employment standards, and giving more power to tenants. Um, that right now um, uh, tenants have very little power in the rental market and, and other provinces do a much better job like Quebec. And, and those things wouldn't cost the government any money and would um, all of a sudden kind of, you know, level the playing field and give more power to people so that they can, um, uh, you know, sort of fight the, the forces of inequality on, a, um, on an individual basis in a better way. Gotcha. Okay, that's going to be the last word. I want to thank the three of you for coming down the QEW and joining okay. us today here in Midtown T.O. Uh, Steve Buist, investigative reporter at the Hamilton Spectator, who just a couple of days ago celebrated his 33rd anniversary with that paper. Well done, sir. Uh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> Sarah Mayo, social planner with the Social Planning and Research Council of Hamilton. Laura Katari, campaign coordinator for the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction. Good of all of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.